where the past comes alive. Hello, I'm Edward Herman. Welcome to the History Channel. In July 1999, an amazing celebration took place in Warren, Ohio, where 100 years before, the Packard motor car was born. The first model was a tiny horseless carriage, slower than many a horse-drawn variety. But then Packard started building luxury cars that became part of the American landscape. Even today, long after the last Packard was produced, the car still inspires remarkable passion. As the ad said, just ask the man who owns one. Please join us now for the History Channel's presentation of Ultimate Autos, The Packard. The automobile has been both vexing us and exciting us for over 100 years. Thousands of auto companies have come and gone. Few left a lasting impression. But one company that disappeared still sends a thrill through the veins of its loyal fans. That company? The Packard Motor Car Company of Detroit, Michigan. It's been ironic, I think, all through history that uh, works of art are most often appreciated after the artist is dead. And I think this is the case of Packard as well. The car is uh, uh, so much more appreciated now. A wonderful automobile to own and drive, mechanically one of the most superior vehicles built in the United States. The summer of 1999 marked the 100th anniversary of Packard's birth. Fans from Southern California to the hills of Pennsylvania and from around the world gathered to extol the virtues of their favorite American car. Why do I like them? Look at these cars. Why do I like them? They're gorgeous. They're just beautiful. Oh, I like the top. They play. They drive beautifully. They, they have nostalgia and charm. I love it. They're very simple. The mechanics are beautifully designed, very simply designed. Yeah. And uh, you can relax and go someplace else. It's like a meditation room. The largest outpouring of appreciation was in Warren, Ohio, Packard's hometown. Well, I could not believe the number of Packards there. It was beyond my comprehension. It was like a birthday party. The Packard was 100 years old. Warren's festivities started on July 4th with an old-fashioned all-American parade. People flocked to Warren to take part in this historic week-long celebration. They all shared a passion for Packards. Fun. Once you start collecting them, they're hard to stop collecting. They're like potato chips. There's a lot of history behind them, and I think that's kind of neat. Our grandpa has some, so it's like you have to love them. It's the American Rolls-Royce. It's a great car. The Packard festivities gave everyone an opportunity to look back to a time when possibilities seemed endless and hope filled the air. The automobile was still a novelty when a Packard first rolled down Warren streets in 1899. The cars were named after the two brothers, James Ward Packard and William Dowd Packard, who built them. Their various enterprises provided employment for about three quarters of Warren's residents. The boy's father, Warren, started the Packard's Ohio dynasty. The father of the Packard brothers, James and uh, William Dowd, was in the hardware business to begin with came to Warren, as they say, with a shirt on his back about 1850. In a matter of a couple years, he owned the only hardware in town. Within a short time, he owned hardware stores in three different towns. He didn't stop there. Soon after that, he got into the lumber business, which led him to uh, the point where he would furnish all the railroad ties from coast to coast for certain uh, railroad companies. So. Uh, their father became quite wealthy from the, the iron and steel and the wood industry of the you know, late 1800s. The two sons built on their father's success. 
1890, the boys started the New York and Ohio Company and made their mark in a new field, electrical devices. The lighting industry was really coming into its own at that time here and everywhere. Edison, what, five or six years before, had made the first light bulb, and now they were into that business. They were fascinated with the wonders of the machine age, including cars. But it wasn't until 1896 that the Packards had a chance to see a car in Warren. A doctor from neighboring Youngstown drove there in a car he'd built himself. At the turn of the century, everybody thought they could build a car. There was a funeral director, a photographer. A, it, it, it didn't matter what you did for a living. If you had any mechanical sense whatsoever, you thought you could build one of these newfangled contraptions. The following year, James Packard saw someone else drive a car through town. He drove through Warren, and of all things, he stopped in front of the Packard Mansion on Mahoning Avenue, and he was giving rides, and it was in the Tribune the next day. James Ward Packard saw this car and decided he wanted one. Luckily, they were built just a few miles away by a Scottish immigrant, Alexander Winton. He was one of the two leading producers of gasoline-powered automobiles in the United States. And when I'm talking major producer, I'm talking somebody who's building five cars a year. I mean, that was a major producer in those days. James Ward Packard certainly had a desire to own one of those that came to the point that he actually bought one. And he had nothing but trouble with it. The drive home was not exactly a joyride. Uh, it, the car broke down innumerable times, and finally it had to be towed. He was disappointed, actually, that he came into Warren behind a team of horses. He got within six miles of the city. It was an all-day drive from Cleveland to Warren, which is only 60 miles. Packard continued to have problems with the car. He had studied enough to know a little bit about mechanics, and now he began studying an awful lot about the Winton. He suggested ways Winton could build better cars. By the last time that uh, uh, James Ward Packard arrived at the factory, Alexander Winton had had enough. Winton told Packard not to bother him again. He said, if you can do a better job, build your own car. The two Packard brothers accepted the challenge and set to work on their own car. It rolled out of the factory on November 6th, 1899. They were quite proud. In that era, when you built an automobile and it actually worked, I mean, this was gangbusters. I mean, this was the big time. The first Packard was a lot like the troublesome Winton in many ways, except one. It was relatively trouble-free. It was steered by a tiller, had bicycle-like wheels, and a one-cylinder rear-mounted engine. It was simple, but it was one of the first American cars. Good morning, Terry. Oh, good morning, Ed. How are you? Yes. So this is it. This is number, number one. Number one. First Dang. Packard ever made. Yes. Yes. Uh, In the presence of greatness. Yeah. <laughs> it's one of the great, great early cars, you know. For a Packard lover, this is like the Holy Grail. We're certainly proud of Precious it. Precious piece of automotive history. <laughs> um, and uh, it was fueled by... Well, they didn't have gasoline stations, uh -huh. so they used naphtha, just cleaning fluids. Really? And so they had to go into the drugstore, go to the basement, and dip a <laughs> gallon out of a barrel. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? I'll say. I'll say. Yeah. Yes, it's amazing. Well, um, you don't suppose we could start up the Holy Grail, do you? You bet we oh, could. Great. Taking a ride in old number one gave me an opportunity to find out more about this fascinating car. Terry Martin told me that the spade handled tiller was replaced with a steering wheel on the next model. It was the first steering wheel ever used on a car. It was powerful for its day it could get up to 40 miles per hour. But that was on a flat surface. Hill climbing was a different story. Who said this job is easy? 
but there are some perks, like driving these great historical autos. While it was advanced for its time, some of its features were rather primitive. The Packards thought that wooden blocks would make great brake linings. You didn't want to go too fast downhill. That first car was quite an achievement, but it was only the beginning. The Packards were off to a roaring start in the automobile business. And they didn't wait long to start building more cars. But they built a total of five cars that first year. But after building that, those first five, each one better than the next, the next year they built nearly 50 cars. And the year after that, uh, something over 80. This, I mean, this was success in the business at the time. This, this, was, this was production. They were stealing sales from Winton and making a name for themselves with the so-called carriage trade. Sales increased so rapidly, they didn't have time to print any brochures. A gentleman from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, called into the office and said, send me the latest literature on your latest model. And the secretary came in and asked Mr. Packard for the literature. He said, well, I'm sorry, we don't have any. Just time to ask the man who owns one. Ask the man who owns one became their indelible signature, known all over the world. It was used right up to the end. It is pure beauty, uh, especially at that era when testimonials, when, when finding out from, from someone that a car actually worked and was good, uh, and that was reliable, that was much better than all of the uh, slogans that, that, that you could put out there. To convince people to leave their horse and buggies behind, car makers had to show that their autos were reliable. The best to demonstrate reliability, of course, was to drive your car a long distance to prove that it could get from here to there. Packard agreed. He decided to have one of his cars make the first drive across the country. The public was captivated by the newspaper accounts of this hazardous journey. So it was just one of these seemingly impossible mechanical feats, and so when it was finally done, it was really a, it was a big event. Packard's cars were becoming known all over the country for their reliability. One buyer, Henry Joy, was so impressed with his car that he wanted to buy the whole company. He bought a Packard, and he loved that car to pieces. I mean, he was tootling all over uh, the Detroit area in it, and it was a wonderful automobile, and he started buying stock in the company because he believed in, in, in the car so much. Joy convinced a few of his fellow Detroiters to buy up all the stock that was available. By 1903, Joy's group had pumped over $250,000 into the company. This gave them control, and they decided to move it to Detroit. The Packard brothers weighed their options and decided to stay in Warren, Ohio. It was a new era for Packard. On September 22, 1903, just 90 days after construction began, the doors opened on Packard's Detroit headquarters. One year after completing his new plant, Joy was turning out the Model L. The Model L gave Packard the uniquely shaped radiator that became the signature feature of all future Packards. Like the Rolls-Royce radiator, it became recognized worldwide. By 1906, Packards were named after the amount of horsepower their engines generated. So the 24 horsepower car line was called the Model 24. Packard literature touted it as the mile a minute car, since it could hit 60 miles per hour in high gear. But speed came at a price. In 1906, the least expensive Packard cost $4,000. The most expensive, the limousine, was priced above $5,000.
the best Ford of the day cost only $850. But price didn't seem to matter to Packard people. Joy's next car, the Model 30, introduced in August of 1906, was a resounding success. It was the first car that broke the thousand car a year mark. They built and sold a thousand cars. And that was, again, an astonishing uh, achievement. But Henry Joy wasn't willing to stop there. Joy was ambitious and had an eye for quality. He also had good taste. He wanted Packard to be the leading maker of luxury cars. Henry Joy looked at Peerless in Cleveland, and he looked at Pierce Arrow in Buffalo, and he said, hey, I want to be like them. To be like them, he needed a six-cylinder car, and that's what he produced. The introduction of the six-cylinder car in 1912 promoted Packard's prestige into the realm of Peerless and Pierce Arrow. They became known as the three Ps. Henry Joy's efforts were also paying off personally. By 1909, he built a large house on the Detroit River. But his vision of the future took him beyond his luxurious surroundings. Every year, he took off on a cross-country car trip. He roughed it as he blazed trails on the still roadless western landscape. These trips convinced him that the country's roads needed to be improved. West of the Mississippi, there were virtually no roads. Uh, if you wanted to travel, you traveled along the, the railroad track frequently because at least you knew that was going some, somewhere. Uh, without a compass, you were just lost. Joy accepted the challenge of heading up a volunteer effort to raise money to build the nation's first transcontinental highway. Prior to the automobile, people were born, raised, and died within 25 miles. You know, a, a day's a horse and buggy run was frequently the, the entire world that a family might know. With the automobile, all of a sudden, miraculously, we could move from place to place, we could go where we wanted, and we could take vacations. Joy knew good roads were needed to allow this change to come about. And good roads would certainly help to sell more cars. The Lincoln Highway Movement was born in 1913, and Joy was its most vigorous parent. It took almost 20 years for Joy's efforts to be fully realized. Joy said, I consider the Lincoln Highway the greatest thing I ever did in my life. His goals, however, were not always the same as others at Packard. Henry Joy was always expansion-minded. He did not want Packard to end at Packard alone. Charles Nash, the ex-president of General Motors, shared Joy's ambitions. They talked about merging Nash's new company with Packard. Unfortunately, it did not make good sense to uh, the board of directors of the Packard Motor Car Company. In 1916, after the board rejected his merger plan, Joy resigned in protest. Alvin McCauley, originally hired by Joy, stepped in. He would guide Packard for the next 40 years. Alvin McCauley inherited a healthy company in 1916. Over 10,000 cars a year were coming out of the ever-growing factory, and profits hit the $6 million mark. While he was concerned with the bottom line, Macaulay didn't want the quest for growth to divert attention from his vision of the company. Alvin Macaulay was once referred to as the only gentleman in the automobile business, and that is precisely how he regarded the Packard. It was a gentleman's car built by gentlemen for gentlemen. His main collaborator, Jesse Vincent, the vice president of engineering, wasn't born rich. But he knew how to create cars that appealed to Packard's wealthy clientele. 
Jesse Vincent is probably one of the ones responsible for turning out a reliable automobile. All the rest were managing and so forth, but Jesse was an engineer. Vincent's first big success as an automotive engineer was the Twin Six, the first 12-cylinder engine for a production car. It was a unique design. It's two six-cylinder motors set on one crankshaft. Each block runs individual by itself with two distributor caps. More power, smoother running, balanced engine. It revolutionized the engine building industry of the world. Nobody had seen or built such an engine to this. The twin six caused such excitement that police had to keep crowds under control when it was first exhibited. This excitement translated into sales. Over 10,000 cars were sold that first year. The Twin Six served as the basis for the Liberty aircraft engine in World War I. After the war, Twin Sixes were used as the power plant for several record-breaking motorboats. On land, Ralph De Palma's Packard-powered cars were topping 149 miles per hour. It was clear that Packard stood for power, reliability, quality, and luxury. But Macaulay and Vincent didn't rest. They decided to drop the Twin Six, and in 1923, they launched a new line, the Single Eight. Vincent's smooth-running new engine was 350 pounds lighter than the Twin Six, developed over 10% more horsepower, and got 20% better gas mileage. The single eight became a Packard mainstay until the mid-1950s. The Packard eight and the Packard six helped the company set all-time sales records. In 1925, Packard earned a profit of over $12 million. Packard had become the choice of America's wealthy car buyers. The richest man in town always had a Packard. And that's how you do it. Packard developed its own sort of cult following among people who had made it and wanted to show that they had made it, but without the flamboyance of buying, say, a Stutz or a car that, that said, hey, I made it. A Packard said, Yes, I made it, but very quietly. Some Packard dealers went beyond the understated approach. They built grand showrooms to enhance the car's prestige. But fancy dealerships weren't the reason people bought Packards. These buyers demanded solid engineering and a car that was built of the finest materials. And they got it. But as the cars became more complicated, there was a growing need for more thorough testing. Something more elaborate than using the vacant lots next to the factory. In 1928, Packard built one of the first automotive proving grounds. The 340-acre, $1 million facility was filled with the latest testing gadgets that money could buy. The heart of the grounds, the test track, was so perfectly banked that you could take your hands off the wheel and drive into a curve at either end at full throttle. It became known as the world's fastest speedway. I've always suspected that uh, Jesse Vincent liked the proving ground best because it gave him a chance to drive around fast, which is what he liked to do more than anything except perhaps engineering automobiles. Along with the track, Vincent and his test drivers had miles of roadways full of hills, dirt paths, sand and water pits, on which they could challenge any Packard's roadworthiness. The demand for new Packards kept the proving grounds busy. The factory was turning out cars and turning a profit. Things couldn't have looked better. In 1929, Packard made $25 million profit. They also were, by far, the world's largest producer of luxury cars. No one at Packard thought that the stock market was going to crash. No one in the automobile industry did. 
The stock market crash of 1929 would have a devastating effect on prestige car makers like Packard. Like many Americans, Alvin McCauley refused to believe that the stock market downturn would last. He had plans to build bigger and better cars. The 20s had been so good. Virtually every year, there were more automobiles built by far than the year before. So when the stock market crashed, everyone thought it was an aberration. McCauley finally admitted that nobody knows how long this depression will continue. Declining sales, however, didn't stop innovation. In fact, the finest automobiles were built, the finest materials, when things were the worst they could ever be. There are always people that have money. Now, the one problem with them is that sometimes they won't spend it during the Depression. To lure these moneyed types into the dealerships, Cadillac, Lincoln, Auburn, and others introduced 12-cylinder engines. Packard followed suit. Cadillac and Marmon even brought out V16s. Don't forget, men like toys. And the bigger the toy, the more expensive the toy, they gotta have it. And this was what they were trying to work with. Packard knew they had to lead. They had no choice. Once one did, it was the domino theory, and everyone, during the worst period in American history, economically, were introducing the most grandiose cars of all. It was bizarre. During the Depression, Packard's styling commanded attention. The Packard automobile has always been a leading and very important car in America. But in the 20s and 30s, it reached its zenith. The most exciting were the limited edition custom-bodied cars. They were special one-offs and, you know, like a dozen were built. They were very, very rare and very expensive. Many feel that the custom V windshield bodies designed and built for Packard by Dietrich and LeBaron between 1932 and 1934 were the ultimate Packards. You can walk around those cars and just study them. They are so beautifully done and in such good taste. Not just new, but new and good and beautiful. Dietrich made six different body styles, ranging from a convertible runabout to grand sport phaetons. The sexy raked windshield set them apart from the production models. It is believed that LeBaron built or designed only 12 of these special custom bodies, four of three different body styles. All were sporty and a little futuristic. The Dietrichs were perhaps more elegant, if more conservative. But Packard enthusiasts are awed by all of these cars. But those cars are the most prized amongst collectors. And I think it's because of their timeless nature, and that'll never change. And, uh, and uh, it'll always be uh, uh, one of the great, great cars of the world. Packard's custom-bodied cars stimulated sales among those who still had money. It only worked for a while. As the Depression wore on, even the wealthy were becoming embarrassed to drive around in these fabulous coach-built automobiles. It became clear to Alvin McCauley that something else needed to be done. By this time, Alvin McCauley was, was convinced that being a luxury producer alone would not make it in the automobile industry. So he introduced a popular price car, a medium price car called the 120. It was a hit right away. The 120 helped Packard set its all-time sales record in 1937. Dealers delivered more than 109,000 cars to eager customers. If it hadn't been for the 120 and the 110, there'd be no Packard at all by 1937. George Christopher, the ex-General Motors executive Macaulay hired to produce the 120, was determined to transform Packard. 
but his only interest was mass production. He regarded the senior packards, the uh, big packards, the costly packers as that damn senior stuff. It would take him a few years to kill off the seniors and customs. One obstacle was a West Coast designer who was making quite a splash for Packard, Howard Dutch Darren. He was a brilliant uh, automobile stylist and designer. He could fashion a body for an automobile that was sensuous and gorgeous and just wonderful. Until 1937, Dutch had been working in Paris, designing cars for wealthy Europeans and playing polo. With the war looming, Dutch moved to Los Angeles, where he could safely hobnob with the stars, design cars, and play polo. Built his first car for Clark Gable. And then, 38, Packard took notice of him. But they said, you will never, ever build for us because you are a playboy. Dutch didn't let the cool reception from Packard's leaders bother him. At one meeting of uh, Packard executives, um, they weren't paying attention to, to one of his designs. And so he just simply stood in front of the car, unloosened his belt buckle, and let his trousers fall to the floor. And by gosh, he got their attention. There was no ignoring Dutch Darren or his swoopy cars. Well, in the meantime, Packard was having trouble with his own line of cars looking a little too stuffy. Reluctantly, they asked Dutch for help. The result was the Clipper. The company downplayed his contribution. The Dutch touch is really in those Packard Clippers. You could see it with the sweeping lines. But in any case, he came up with a wonderful design, uh, which was not totally practical and which uh, Packard made into a practical production automobile, which irked him mightily because the only thing Dutch ever cared about was how a car looked. It didn't matter who designed it or how good the car was, America was at war by 1942, and car production would have to wait. During the war, Packard, like all the other car makers, had to quit making cars. They did sell some leftover clippers to the military. Of course, they became the favorites of the generals. They've now become collector's items. The Army ordered 387 of them, all with identical ignition and door keys, all keyed the same. Not everyone was fond of the identical keys. So what an enterprising driver would do, you break off some keys in the locks and destable them, lock three doors from the inside, put a $2 padlock on there, and when you come out, your car is still there. These cars didn't have the regal finishes civilian Packard sported. Nothing could shine. If an airplane sees a flash, it's a target. Yeah. So everything... Everything had to be covered up, and mm -hmm. pot, like the dashboard, the real pretty dash, mm -hmm. OD. Everything in there is olive drab. That's, that's the way a military vehicle has to be. The war made it clear just how far word about Packard's quality had traveled. Stalin persuaded Roosevelt to give Russia the tooling for the older style Packards. Rolls-Royce officials were also aware of Packard's quality. They asked the American car company to produce a version of their aviation engine, the Merlin. The Rolls-Royce over in England couldn't keep up with the production. They didn't have the facilities, so they needed somebody to build it. And Packard did a tremendous job. They turned out in total 55,523 engines, to be precise, all to a, a brilliant standard. Packard also built almost 20,000 engines for PT boats and the rescue boats that raced to pick up downed flyers. Packard's employees had pitched in and helped to win the war. And like everyone else, they were in a hurry to get back to a normal life. Rationing was over, and people finally had something to buy. 
Most wanted a new car. But it took some time for the manufacturers to shift from making arms to building cars. The shortage created a boom time for Packard. America was car starved. No new automobiles had been built since shortly after Pearl Harbor. Anything on four wheels that ran, we wanted. So Packard had no trouble selling anything that was coming off the line. Packard's first post-war cars were warmed over clippers. They began to look dated compared to the cars other companies were making. Packard's new president, George Christopher, tried to make up for lost time. He finally had his chance to transform the company. He told the stylists he wanted a new Packard, not just an updated clipper. It was ready for the 1948 model year. Instead of the clipper, Packard built an automobile that came to be known as the elephant or the bathtub. Neither of these for an automobile is a compliment. Despite the reactions of the critics, over 98,000 Packards were sold in 1948. It was the second best sales year the company had ever had. Christopher pushed ahead with ambitious plans to upgrade manufacturing to produce 200,000 cars a year. It soon became clear that Christopher wasn't going to reach his sales goals. The 1950 model year ended with just over 100,000 cars sold. Unfortunately, the money he'd spent was a serious drain on Packard's finances. And ultimately, uh, the Packard Board of Directors uh, became totally on fond, I guess you could say, of George Christopher, and he was fired in the Packard way. In 1950, Christopher retired to his farm, a good place to keep one of the cars an auto rider had called a goat. In 1952, the board convinced James Nance, the president of Hot Point, to jump into the skillet at Packard. What endeared Nance to a Packard was the fact that he had always been a success. The man had never had a failure. And Packard needed someone with pizzazz and someone with a sense of confidence and um, someone who was a success. And that's what James Nance was. The public response to the Pan American show car gave Nance an opportunity to demonstrate his knack for success. So many people asked when it was going to be produced, Nance rushed to actually build something like it, the Caribbean. So it wasn't introduced until about uh, April of 53. Mm -hmm. They just took the standard convertible, modified it, painted it and got it out of the, got it out of, onto the, uh, the showroom. But it was a very classy, popular car. It was, it's beautiful, but this was the original and I think it was the best. Nance wanted to bring prestige back to Packard. And he did it with the Caribbean, which is a marvelous car. It's my, one of my favorite cars of the, the 50s and will be remembered by many. But the company's problems were mounting. A credit crunch in 1953 sent sales sliding at a time when Ford and General Motors were dumping more cars on the market every month than Packard could build in a year. To compete, Nance wanted to combine the remaining independent car companies, Nash, Hudson, and Studebaker, with Packard. By joining together all of their forces, they thought that they could battle the big giants in the industry. But George Mason, the head of Nash, Nance's longtime friend, died in 1954, before a deal could be completed. Mason's successor, George Romney, decided to combine Nash with Hudson to form American Motors and leave Packard and Studebaker behind. Nance pursued Studebaker and went ahead with the acquisition. The merger of Studebaker and Packard uh, 
was a shotgun wedding, and it resulted in a marriage made in hell. Neither company looked carefully enough at the other's books, and Studebaker was in worse trouble than Packard. Just when it seemed things couldn't get worse, troubling reports about the new 1955 Packard started to be heard. Warranty repairs helped plunge the company $30 million into the red in 1955. Quality improved in 56, as did styling. Nance assured everyone that the worst was over. But the banks weren't buying his story. Nance had gone around to all the banks and got a load of cash in 54. And when he reappeared for more cash in 56, he says, you've already got us too deep in debt. No dice, no money. Nance was forced out, and Packard's headquarters were moved to the Studebaker building in South Bend, Indiana. The combined company transformed Studebakers into something they could offer as Packards to the dealers. The cars were derisively called Packard Bakers and just didn't sell. Everybody had hope, but in the end, it, it, it failed. By 1959, Packard was phased out. At the end was... Uh, was, was truly tragic. It, it was a press release that said Packard was gone. And that was it. But Packard loyalists didn't go away. All of us who are deep in the car culture, like I am, have been in it forever. We like all cars, but the Packard was the ultimate car to have. For some, it still is. Ironically, the same year that fans saluted the car's 100th anniversary, in Detroit, the demolition of the old factory began. But in Warren, Ohio, they celebrated the opening of a new Packard Museum. It was clear that Packard had touched a lot of people. can have charisma, and a Packard had it in spades. Even though the company is no longer with us, a Packard will always be one of the great cars of the world. <laughs>